So we have talked about how uh, Frankfurt School talked about society and culture, ideology. Now let us come to the new left. The new left as a movement was powerful in the 1960s and 70s. Remember Frankfurt School was just before that. 30s, 40s. And the new left was partly a reaction against orthodox Marxism. Like cultural studies also later was. A reaction against orthodox Marxism and communist party's authoritarianism. At that time, communist party, not at that time, at all times in fact, communist party was authoritarian, it uh, was oppressive to its own people. And uh, there was a Hungarian revolution at that time, which the communist party did not favor. It was against the Soviet Union. Hungary fought against Soviet Union and actually Hungary was on the right side. But uh, Communist Party did not appreciate it because it was against Soviet Union. They were intolerant. So all these things disillusioned. I hope you understand. All these things at that time disillusioned the uh, thinkers of that time. And there were some excellent Marxist thinkers like Antonio Gramsci, Louis Althusser, who inspired the new left thinkers. The new Marxists who are uh, doing Marxist revisionism, who are questioning Marxism itself. The new left thinkers were influenced by Gramsci and Althusser. The new left people talked not only about materialism and uh, economy, that is what the Marxists were obsessed with. The new left people talked not only about materialism, they talked about culture, they talked about civil rights, they talked about women's rights. The rights of the gay people, LGBTIQ people. So the new left was more broad in its perspective. It was wider. And the father of the new left was, called, uh, was Herbert Marcuse. Herbert Marcuse was a German Jewish philosopher associated with the Frankfurt School. We have seen that already. He did a lot of things. I'm not going into all those details because our main topic is cultural studies. I should not end up teaching you Marxism. So, I just mentioned here two of his most important works. Also to remind you that in exams like NET, look up all these major thinkers, look up their major works. Sometimes the title of the work is a concept of that author. Most of the time. So, like that you should make your own notes apart from all this. Your own notes with all the major thinkers and their works and what they did etc. It is easy if you sit down for like half an hour every day, in a, in a few weeks you can complete it. It is that easy. So make notes like that. Herbert Marcuse's two important works are Heroes and Civilization and uh, One Dimensional Man. Always Marxists thought that material uh, life or material aspects of life is what define our culture and our uh, identity. Marxists believe that materialism or money is the base. Everything else is the superstructure. In Herbert Marcuse's Heroes and Civilization, he is changing the focus completely. In post-war mass culture, we are all in post-war mass culture in a way. At the from the beginning itself, 1960s itself, in post-war mass culture, you are following? There is a profusion of inauthentic false needs. We think we need a lot of things. We actually don't need it. In Facebook again, you see so many different kinds of socks. What is the need for all these socks that will separate your fingers, uh, with toes I mean. Uh, socks that will uh, the, you know, protect your toes, protect your heels. Socks that will, I don't know what, they create a lot of things. Yeah, I also need to protect my heels. Suddenly I will think and buy that socks. <laughs> Even though I have no need for it. Did you understand? So, false needs we have. They are creating for us false needs. We think, yeah, I need that. Because I never, un endless examples I can give you for false needs. Capitalism in the post-war mass culture creates for us inauthentic false needs which we have nothing to do with but they become our needs. Then sexual provocations and instantaneous gratification. 
we are a highly sexed society that is why eros and civilization the title eros eros and thanatos remember eros is life drive sex drive thanatos is death death drive because of internet uh, our masculinity and femininity our appearance our bodies our sexuality our sexual needs have become uh, over emphasized this is why we have we are such a frustrated society we need we we keep even though you know many of us in many communities are liberated but we want more liberation we want you know to show our liberation in uh, more more ways we want to rebel we want to uh, possess our identities in you know especially in metropolitan societies the more metropolitan we become their liberation is somehow not enough because they want to assert their uh, sexuality and physicality their material uh, needs etc more and more and they all want instantaneous gratification we are not ready to suffer we are not ready to change we are not ready to undergo any transformation we want everything immediately this is why we have come become a rape culture because of this frustration because of these false ideologies because actually men do not have all those problems with women so to speak especially in metropolitan societies people are largely liberated in many ways compared to the uh, rural suburban women and men what is the problem in cities the problem is not real the problem is created by capitalism i hope you understand and uh, Herbert Marcuse says that because of the profusion of needs of uh, commodities of uh, you know methods of gratification i am depressed i need to smoke i am even more depressed i need to drink i am even more depressed i need to go dancing i need to go dancing in the disco every day actually you are not depressed <laughs> we have 100000 reasons sorry things to consume because we are depressed in the metros i'm so depressed let me watch that movie i'm so depressed let me uh, go to the mall why depression why loneliness because you are not talking to anybody you don't have friends you don't have uh, you know real meaningful social life you have nothing to do with your family you don't talk to them you don't meet your cousins you don't have the traditional lifestyle you are always alone in the social media you feel meaningless you feel lonely who asked you to do that people in metros do not even have time to get married or have children or families because they are after careers they are after actually do we need all these things do we need so much money do we not need so much success did we don't actually we can be happy being what we are but we are never happy because we want more 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 nothing is enough we will never say i have all this i'm happy no no none of us is happy we are after something else that we don't have because of capitalism i hope you understand it is all interrelated it is unnecessary but we can't help it because capitalism forces us into it everywhere we turn we are bombarded with commodities and needs and requirements for which we we should make money we should do this do that so in the post war mass culture there is a profusion of inauthentic false needs sexual provocations instantaneous gratification all these ultimately keep people repressed they keep people apolitical because they don't have time and also facebook and social media teaches you good morning be, be uh, thankful for your wonderful day uh, you know be, let us be happy let this only happiness numbness don't be unhappy don't be depressed don't be this if you are depressed you come to the mall uh, by these things <laughs> i am depressed that doesn't mean i should consume anything let me be depressed i am depressed because the country is going to the dogs i am depressed because people are dying i am depressed because values are dying out i am depressed because we are all fighting that doesn't mean i have to go to the mall and consume pepsi or popcorn at the movies i hope you understand sometimes it is good to suffer sometimes it is good to have some pain 
it is good to be depressed also. We don't have to be consumers. So, it is better to be away from capitalism. It is better to be not consuming so much. It is better to be a little critical. It is better to be political because politics is there in every aspect of our life. I am saying things that I believe, but I am also saying things, these things because it is there in New Left and culture studies also. There is nothing in this life divorced from politics. People say, don't speak politics. You are all, you, you know, intellectuals speaking politics. Show me one thing in life, culture studies will say. Show me one thing in life that is not political. There is nothing that is not political. There is nothing through which power doesn't work. There is nothing that we do in life that is not constructed by uh, uh, ideologies and corporations and, you know, discourses. So, uh, Herbert Marcuse shows how in this mass consumerist society, people have become repressed, apolitical, uncritical. He calls this with the term repressive desublimation. Just take it like that. If you want, you read up on your own later. I'm not going into more of that. I'm going to the next point. And we have all become one-dimensional men. One-dimensional man refers to bourgeois life in Europe and America where there is a numbness, there is no critical thinking, there is no questioning, there is no rebellion. We are also becoming like that more and more. One dimensional man, just consumption, nothing else. In the West it is like that. People don't have time for other people, they don't uh, have time for their families, they don't even meet their families. I, uh, when I was in Canada, like 15 years ago, not even now, 15 years ago, I saw, I had a white Canadian, I will give you, to give you one example, I had a white Canadian woman, a friend, she was doing PhD in her 60s, 65 years old she was. And uh, I was amazed, oh, you're doing PhD at this age now. She says, yeah, because I need the money. Oh. <laughs> See, even that is a modification. And then, uh, then she said, uh, today I have this dance to go to, I wanted to go dancing. But my, uh, my daughter is coming and I have not seen her for the far past three years, so I guess I have to go and meet her. That is not how my mother will say about me. <laughs> and uh, then she said, yeah, I have to go and meet her because uh, I hear that she had cancer and had a surgery for that. So poor thing, she must have suffered a lot. I have to go and see her. <laughs> Forget cancer, if I have one cold, I'm mad, I'm cold. <laughs> I would have gone running to her. <laughs> that is a normal family. Because of a, and then she said, my son is uh, coming to Vancouver. Nearby he's going to live. Oh, I'm so excited. I'll be able to see him more often. I said, so are you going to leave this house and go and live with your son? She said, no way. He'll charge more rent from me than this. This is cheaper. Then I told my parents, did you hear that? People are taking rent from their parents. <laughs> <laughs> Such a different culture. They are normal people. Not, you know, abnormal people. <laughs> so much different cultures are. And so one dimensional. What do they do? Because they don't have children staying with them. They don't know anything about their children. They have nothing to do in life. No cooking, no. Because everything is like easy food there. What do they do? They consume. That is what they do. <laughs> one dimensional men they become. They, and you should look at American media. Of course, CNN and uh, CNN is very conservative, but the news channels are there. There's a lot of news happening, but it is more like entertainment for them. It is like watching movies for them. They, they, they don't really get involved. So one dimensional man. The new left was there across the world, across the Western world. The new left in Britain is associated in the 1950s with E.P. Thompson. E.P. Thompson was one of the founding members Founding fathers of cultural studies, E.P. Thompson. I will come to him presently. Along with John Saville, E.P. Thompson founded the journal, The Reasoner. The Reasoner is a journal that he founded. Both John Saville and E.P. Thompson were members of the 
Communist Party Historians Group, CPHG. Very soon, they were asked to stop the journal because it did revolutionary things. They refused to stop the journal. They were thrown out from the party. Communist Party is like that, authoritarian. They don't want dissent. They don't want people to question them. E.P. Thompson was thrown out from the party and he started the New Reasoner. This New Reasoner journal merged with another journal and later became the very famous New Left Review. It is the most important founding uh, journal of cultural studies. New Left Review uh, started in 1960 and uh, Stuart Hall was associated with it, the major culture studies theorist. E.P. Thompson departed from orthodox Marxism, engaged in Marxist revisionism. You have heard these words before. And he was against the Communist Party's confused reaction against Hungary in the Hungarian Revolution against Soviet Union. There were two things that happened about which the Communist Party did not have a proper stance. And E.P. Thompson and other leftist thinkers criticized the party for it. One, the Communist Party was confused in its reaction against the Hungarian Revolution. Two, the British and French invasion of the Suez Canal zone. About that also, I, I, I don't know a lot about that event. You can look it up later. I, uh, I don't want to talk about it. Whatever I know also, I don't want to talk about it because we have to move on. So because of these wrong or confused stances that the Communist Party took about historical events at this time, uh, the new left in Britain went against the Communist Party and formed the new left. The thinkers criticized the party. Did you understand? The new left review was very prominent in the 1960s. And under the leadership of the very famous man, Perry Anderson. Perry Anderson is a very important editor of the New Left Review. Under, the, under his influence, they popularized Frankfurt School ideas. We talked about that briefly. Antonio Gramsci's ideas like hegemony, subaltern. And they promoted ideas of Louis Althusser who was also a Marxist thinker who came after for Marx and revised Marx's ideas. Louis Althusser is associated with ideas like uh, ideological state apparatuses, repressive state apparatuses, interpolation. We will come to that uh, briefly. And uh, as a result of all these activities in the journal New Left Review, there emerged in the US and the UK student organizations and student movements uh, which were very influential. These student movements were very influential at least in two ways. One, at this time, America got unnecessarily involved in the Vietnam Civil War. There was a fighting in Vietnam. Vietnamese were fighting Vietnamese. It was a civil war. America sided with one of the parties against the communists in Vietnam because America was against communism and this resulted in very disastrous consequences. Lots of people died, both Americans and Vietnamese. It was the most unpopular war of the century. There were widespread protests against the Vietnam War <laughs> and the student movements of the 1960s played a major role in that. Are you getting me? There was also in 1968 Student and working class protest movements, very huge movements against the Charles de Gaulle government of France. In France, there was a very despotic, very tyrannical uh, ruler uh, called Charles de Gaulle. And uh, president, I think, he was. And he was very, he ruled with an iron hand, very autocratic and oppressive. Students and factory workers got united and they uh, you know, protested in large numbers against the government. They were crushed by the de Gaulle government. But May 1968 revolves in France were the beginning of a very major uh, age of democracy and civil rights 
it inspired literary theory all that was inspired by the new left review and the student movements of that time culture studies has its foundations in all these movements and events culture studies is fiercely against oppression and uh, stands for freedom and intellectual rights is that clear the new left in britain also includes stuart hall stuart hall was a black cultural theorist he was a black man who came from jamaica in living in britain at that time britain was multi ethnic but black thinkers were not there very much stuart hall was one of the first black thinkers in britain and after him came a lot of black scholars and philosophers like paul gilroy angela macrobi isaac julian etc stuart hall was the founding editor of new left review and in 1964 he became the director of cccs which is the contemporary uh, center for contemporary cultural studies at the university of birmingham which is the uh, breeding ground of culture studies that is where culture studies was born stuart hall a very major name he died in 2002 then Raymond Williams was another important figure associated with culture studies i'm not i've i've not done with stuart hall i'm just introducing we will deal with him separately in detail raymond williams was a very influential thinker also and laid the foundations of not only cultural studies but also cultural materialism it was in the book the long revolution that he talked about cultural materialism which is uh like new historicism a revision of history and the canon and the very famous thinker terry eagleton was a student of raymond williams so these great thinkers and great works were all there as part of the new left in britain then the new left in the us i am still in the introduction to culture studies okay that that introduction is very important because that is the foundation the new left created student movements in the us also there were students for democratic society or sds a very major association of students who stood for free speech the right for freedom of speech and for academic freedom in india also students student movements are there at this time and uh, some of these are crushed by the government like student movements always have been whenever people spoke out and asked for freedom they were only crushed but many student movements either overcame it or even though they are crushed they became inspiration for later movements and later developments now student movements of the us in the 1960s it was they who coined the term establishment it should be a capital e is a typing mistake it should be a capital e here they coined the term establishment all the mainstream ideas they called it establishment and the student movements were anti establishment the student movements of this time advocated anarchist counter cultural values chaos or anarchy is not always bad sometimes discipline is bad discipline means oppression discipline means silencing sometimes when it is unnatural naturally if you are disciplined okay but unnaturally if discipline is imposed on people their silence doesn't mean they are disciplined so anarchy they advocated against unnatural discipline and silencing the student movements supported counter cultural values this is the 1960s the 1960s in america and us uh, sorry america and the uk is the time of counter cultural movements so many subcultures counter cultures emerged at this time the hippies the yippies the black uh, the bikers the rockers so on and so forth so many of them the beat generation they stood against the establishment they explored 
oh, go alternate ideologies they all explored new ways of uh, expression and existence and lifestyle the counter culture movements of the 1960s is extremely important in the birth of cultural studies the student movements of the USA were associated with anti vietnam war protests with the association called industrial workers of the world it is a an association that held a big role in us history and in eugene o'neill's a uh, hairy ape yes. he goes to the office of the industrial workers of the world iww yes. and uh, this is also the time in the us of black radicalism blacks became militant and they began to assert their black pride the, it was the time of black power movement there was the militant black panther party like franz fanon said sometimes when you oppress people too much they become violent the sometimes governments turn oppress the people they oppress more 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 so that the people will become violent and then it will become legitimate for the government to finish them they are violent so we killed them so we taught them a lesson that is a technique that human societies have always used to about to annihilate the other so very bad the blacks are violent sometimes in, at this time black panther party was a militant party it was a rebellion against oppression and ostracization this was also the time when women began to speak out and find their voices the 1960s feminist movement is very famous and important feminism started in the end of the 19th century itself but this second wave of feminism was the political phase of feminism it was also the time when rachel carson wrote silent spring attacking capitalism and its consumerism its pollution rachel carson talked about how our springs will become silent even now i feel it in my childhood atmosphere was not like this i realize anywhere i, I go i realize there were more birds more insects all the time sometimes so loud the insects and birds they are chirping now it is silent very rarely one or two birds you will hear even at night or dusk when the insects like crickets are all loudly chirping nothing you hear very very dangerous and sad because they have died of pollution that pollution is creeping in it is coming for us very soon i fear that now everywhere you look there are people the day will come let it not be in my lifetime but the day will come when there won't be so many people like in dystopian novels if we are not careful in large numbers we will die of cancer or some disease because of our consumerist life we don't care again i am telling you before you use a cosmetic before you eat a food at that time if you do it nothing will happen but do you really need it avoid it look for some healthier more natural option if possible be it is very important and uh, environmentalist movement came into being at this time environmentalism the awareness that capitalism has is slowly killing our earth killing our environment became very strong at this time in the 1960s it is also related to the new left the center for Col contemporary cultural studies or cccs triple cs whatever you want you can say was formed as a result of the reevaluation of the class or elite character of culture i was in a dilemma when i made the powerpoint presentation i thought should i pack it with big big words and points like this or take some points and make it interesting i can also do that make it interesting and discuss it to give more examples and you will all be happy and you will understand the basics 
but i thought let it be even if you get a little bored i will try to make it interesting within i i deliberately made it full of points because even if you feel a little sleepy here in between i we can uh, do some game or some activity or i can just move out and I'll then that will uh, help you uh, stay alert but when you take photographs and it is valuable later on you can use it and study it and read it again and so that is why i made the powerpoint so full of points and so many things because i was not looking at it like fast food i was looking at it like <laughs> fast food is instant gratification if i teach only 10 points here without loading it with information i can make you feel like wow it was wonderful <laughs> but only 10 points you got better than that it is better to load it with nutrition so that in the coming months and years also you can use it <laughs> understood so it was a deliberate political act okay <laughs> <laughs> so center for contemporary cultural studies formed as a result of the reevaluation of the class or elite character of culture as appeared in the traditional literary studies in the class i don't know why i said class i it sounds like wrong i can i uh, forget the class elite character of culture that, that will focus on when i i must have been sleepy when i wrote it i don't remember what class <laughs> reevaluation of the elite character of culture culture until then remember matthew arnold f r lewis yes oh, wow she has culture <laughs> we have expressions like that yes. she has culture means what she has culture is that what you mean <laughs> no that culture means high class do you understand do you say that in gujarat we say that in kerala that's why she has culture means very high class high culture culture was defined as high elite pure perfect culture is the study of perfection remember matthew arnold said reevaluation of that concept culture studies is the reevaluation of that concept of culture as elite as pure as perfect traditional literary studies looked at culture as elite perfect pure cultural studies is reevaluating it and changing the concept of culture culture studies was pioneered by richard hogarth and raymond williams the influences are richard hogarth's book uses of literacy and raymond williams's culture and society these books came in 1957 58 period and hogarth was the founder of the triple cs at the university of birmingham in 1964 later earlier i said 1964 stuart hall that is wrong i do you remember i paused there it is a mistake it is 1971 remember earlier one slide when i said about stuart hall i said uh, it's a mistake she this is a mistake in 1971 yeah so that proves that even if you make one mistake it's okay you can correct it later <laughs> richard hogarth it was hogarth who became the director in 64 richard hogarth became the director of cccs the first director in 1964 and later in 1971 stuart hall became the director okay in the late 1990s something happened at the university of birmingham and triple cs was stopped politics mm. at the university of birmingham there was some politics other professors did not like uh, hogarth and uh, stuart hall becoming so famous etc i suppose i don't know and uh, <laughs> triple cs was eliminated triple cs was stopped so let us take a look in detail at the pioneers richard hogarth lived from 1918 to 2014 richard hogarth came very importantly from a working class background he was not elitist he was not upper class that is why he revised the elitist foundations of traditional culture mm. 
he understood that traditional culture sorry traditional theory looks at culture as high and elite coming from a working class background he associated culture with everyday working class realities did you understand so uh, richard hogarth came from the working class background he wrote about the working classes he understood that culture is not only about the upper classes it is also about ordinary people his major book uses of literacy aspects of working class life is about how working class life changed with the advent of capitalism how capitalism has affected the working classes of course working class is the result of capitalism if there are no industries there are no working classes working classes are the result of capitalism it is because of capitalism that there are working classes at the same time working classes have been affected by capitalism that is what he is studying in this book uh, it is an attempt to understand the changes in culture in britain caused by massification or mass culture mass consumption did you understand mass production started in industries mass consumption started because of all this mass media also came at that time working class the nature of the working class changed working class used to be associated with ideal values they were rural you know villages villages are so perfect traditionally ideal values pure simple uh, you know wonderful people all that has changed because of capitalism today even villages are not so pure and great <laughs> and once upon a time before capitalism villages were wonderful places working classes were wonderful people but with capitalism the nature of all this has changed did you understand so he he writes two parts in this book he has there are two parts in this book he recalls the lost working class culture in northern england working class culture as a pure beautiful thing is now lost that he writes about secondly he attacks the impact of post war consumer culture how consumerism has changed all of us for example guru or teacher another example you will understand teachers used to be such wonderful people they knew everything they will teach people and they make us better human beings in the past traditionally the teachers were uncorrupted people but are they uncorrupted people are is any professional uncorrupted now everybody is corrupted by capitalism and consumerism you go to a doctor he doesn't not all doctors of course not all teachers but many teachers and many doctors do not really care about you their medicine or uh, teaching or whatever has become a commodity did you understand doctors might even prescribe you medicines that are harmful to you deliberately also so that they will, you will you will go back to him and treat, get treatment for the second disease also you get <laughs> you never know so capitalism has changed us doctors are affected influenced by capitalism that's why otherwise they can't survive <coughs> politicians used to be such wonderful people Imam, remember indian independence movement and before that every politician at that time was selfless sacrifice their life for the country they were so um moral morally uh, above everyone isn't it such great people thinkers they were philosophers s s uh, you know selfless service they gave us is there any politician who is like that now no is there any doctor is there any anybody everybody has been influenced by capitalism did you understand as an edupreneur like i said in the morning i am also influenced by capitalism i i i i i i should work for money too there is no escape from it like sir said otherwise i can't survive but being students of english literature within all this you can still find values there are ways of connecting with people helping each other even when you help yourself i know from practice that it is not all lost there are ways in which you can still remain human you can still do good things within this corrupt system did you understand that is our challenge we have to find ways of existing like that 
there is no escape from lays and pepsi at some point or the other we have to eat fast food we have to eat all these chemicals there is no escape from pollution if you don't use this you somewhere else you will be caught but even within this corrupt system of pollution and for chemicals and fast food there is still some ways in which we can reduce pollution we can reduce consumption you understand that is our challenge you can't completely escape the system but within which within the system you there are ways in which you can be less influenced by the system it is necessary to critique it is necessary to question it is necessary to think against the mainstream did you understand that will help you lib to be liberated in many ways so he attacks the impact of post war consumer culture why i said this is because it looks like a futile exercise we are speaking so much against post war consumer culture you can ask me this question but are you also a consumer i am every day 100 things i am consuming there is no escape you are all consumers however much we talk about it there is no escape but it is important to realize what we are doing it is important to critique in some ways it is important to resist even when i buy 90 things for the last 10 things i should think no i don't need it at least that you can't avoid plastic completely but you can reduce it you can be aware at least all of us can reuse some of the plastic at least that we are using did you understand that is what we are aiming at some change if all of us change a little bit it will be a big change ep thompson 1924 to 1993 was a, uh, again as you know a british historian and new left theorist he is the author of the making of the english working class a very important book by ep thompson is the making of the english working class it came just before the triple cs was established in 1963 and uh, it is a massive book on the development of the working class in the 18th and 19th centuries in the 18th and 19th centuries how did the working class develop we are looking at the history so that we can learn lessons from it it was the first systematic history of the working class and it defined class social class as a relationship social class is a relationship it is not a social structure same with the kind uh, with the with, with the with caste the uh, in traditional societies caste was more like a relationship and uh, societies worked well like that but it it changed completely in modern societies caste became oppressive caste became uh, a, a means of you know exerting power on other people that is when it went completely wrong i'm not saying caste at any time is good it is not but why did the people in the past did not fight against caste that is because it worked well in some ways for them so class ep thompson says is a relationship we should focus on the relationship it can be both good as well as oppressive and uh, uh he studied what did he do he studied documents from the people working class people's lives the working class people were never able to represent themselves in history they were always represented by other people for the first time here is ep thompson studying working class people's documents their letters their writings their documents are being studied for the first time their court records most of the time they were illiterate they did not write anything the documents how you know about their life is sometimes when working class people were arrested for some reason they were taken to court in the court they gave testimony these court testimonies became documents of understanding working class life did you understand take the very poor slum dwellers or uh, very poor laborers who are not even laborers in the cities etc they are they don't go to school they don't have water water id they are very uh, poor people how do you study them do they write novels and books no no how do they have nobody represents them how will you study them you can study them like this when they are arrested and taken to court how what look at the irony of it so sad <laughs> when they are arrested and taken to court they will give testimony that will become a document understand so court testimonies became 
documents for E.P. Thompson, their folk art, songs, ballads. These are all documents which historians at that time, th these are all documents that are very different from what historians accepted as documents at that time. Documents at that time were very formal, very elite, very, you know, major books that are written, major things. Here, he is talking about very low things. Mm. Did you understand? Court testimonies, folk songs. These are documents that are very different from what historians at that time accepted as documents. <laughs> Did you understand? All historians talked about documents. Wow! While they were talking about documents, E.P. Thompson talked about documents. <laughs> Understood? And uh, the, what did, why did he do that? To study the development of a working class consciousness. How the working classes think. The working classes also think. They also have something to say. E.P. Thompson proved for the first time. Like Franz Fanon proved for the first time. The oppressed the black people also have a consciousness. They also think. Imagine we are, we are a middle class family. There is some very poor old man or young man also. Somebody illiterate, voiceless, somebody working in the, uh, our farm or our backyard, cleaning and things like that. Many times we will forget that that is a human being. Many times, even now, many times we will forget that that human being also has feelings. Abe, you jo, ja, do this, do that, making like in Kuli. We, we will make them act like animals sometimes. As if they don't have feelings, they don't have pain, they don't have tiredness, as if they don't have hunger. We should never do that. We should be careful. In Kuli, uh, Mulkraj Anand's Kuli, uh, Munnu is treated like a monkey. In Babu Nathuram's house, I think. He is made to do so many things as if he is not even a human being. Everybody is making him work, 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 work. And treating him like an animal. Did you understand? So here is E.P. Thompson for the first time showing that, hello, working classes also have consciousness. They also have feelings. They also have things to say. So he studied the development of working class consciousness. Next is Raymond Williams. I packed this slide with so many things. <laughs> I'm sorry. I ho Are you feeling bored? No. <sighs> Shall I tell you one truth? I'm uh, playing for your sympathy. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to say, I didn't say. I had, um, I had a PowerPoint, I had notes, I had a blog, I had uh, so many, all my documents were lying in different, different, different ways. Last night, the day before that, I couldn't sleep because Christmas is very important in Kerala. And now we are very multicultural. Uh, we celebrate all other people's festivals very ardently now to retain our secularism and you know uh, Hindus celebrate Christmas, uh, Christians celebrate Eid like that. And uh, Christmas I, I had friends and we had a uh, celebration and that night at 3 o'clock I had to travel to Ahmedabad. And uh, last night I slept again at 3 o'clock or 3.30 because I was working on this PowerPoint collecting all the information that I already had. And at first, PowerPoint was very simple. All points were not there. But then I thought, if I just speak and go, you will not get everything. It is better I put it in writing here on the wall so that you can take pictures and read it again. And Because if, when you spend one day full of uh, you know, effort like this, it is going to be a very hard day today for both of us. <laughs> But that one day should be enough for a lifetime. So much you should get. Otherwise, why, why should I take all the effort? So 3 o'clock till 3 o'clock, I have not slept for two days. And I got up at 6 o'clock also. So my head is breaking actually. But I, I want to do it. I like doing it. Please don't be bored. <laughs> Please don't be sleepy. Blackmail, blackmail. <laughs> It's all cultural studies, you can't blame me. <laughs> so, Raymond Williams uh, lived from 1921 to 1988. For all the major people, you should remember when they lived, when their books were published. 
they will ask, arrange the following chronologically and questions like that in net. Did you understand? When you study itself, you should study, understand in that, direct, in that sense. Then actually net is a very easy exam. If you know properly the basics, easily you will pass net. That is the truth. But you should know the basics and you should know it properly. <coughs> It, you should not pass MA without knowing Raymond Williams. <laughs> you should not pass Stuart, uh, no, MA without knowing Stuart Hall also. Those base, it, it is like saying you should not pass MA without knowing some Shakespeare. <laughs> I never heard of Shakespeare, but I have MA in English. Is that possible? <laughs> is that possible? <laughs> like that it is. Did you understand? So, um, Raymond Williams was also born into a working class family. Very important. Derrida who questioned uh, Christian uh, uh, you know, foundations of knowledge was a Jew. Raymond Williams who followed the elite, uh, who questioned the elitist foundations of culture was from the working class. He was born in Wales. That is also a marginal place in UK. He was born in Wales, he joined the Communist Party, he fought in the Second World War and his first major book was Culture and Society. Published the year after the making of the English working class came. E.P. Thompson's book, 1957. Raymond Williams' first book, 1958. Okay? Culture and society. They will ask chronologically arrange. The, the following are all culture studies texts, arrange them chronologically. If you have studied properly, you will be able to arrange. If they give four or five books that are to be arranged chronologically, you don't need to know all the five books in the exam. If you know one or two, two famous ones within it, you will be able to get the answer. The paper, question paper setters in net are such kind, wonderful people. <laughs> they don't want you to know everything. They just want you to know the basics, the most important things. Unnecessarily, you suspect them. <laughs> you understand? So, study properly. Cultural, so, culture and society was inspired by T.S. Eliot's very major work, Notes Towards the Definition of Culture. T.S. Eliot, remember, had an elitist conception of culture. Culture is high and mighty, elitist, pure, perfect. It was uh, inspired by T.S. Eliot against it. And it was against the prevalent notion of high spiritual culture. Have some culture means what? It doesn't mean popular culture, right? So, culture was defined as high spiritual. Uh, culture and society by Raymond Williams is against that notion. Uh, High culture or traditionally, culture was segregated from the popular and the ordinary. Culture is what is not popular. Culture is what is not ordinary. In order to see what is culture, you have to go to museums. <laughs> Did you understand? And at that time, culture was also against social equity. Against the social equity. At that time, high culture did not believe that everybody is equal. High culture did, did not believe in democracy. Some are great, others are all bad. <laughs> Canon. High works, high culture as against the popular, low, bad, corrupted. Clear? I remember in my childhood and in, in the days when I started, do, when I was doing BA, if I was reading some popular fiction, my father is a professor. If I was reading some popular novels, etc., my father always used to say, why are you wasting your time reading popular novels? Read some uh, classics. <laughs> he used to say that. He forced me to read classics and put away my popular fiction. Poor man, my father, he didn't know cultural studies is coming. <laughs> Now we have, to we have to tell students, why are you wasting time reading classics? <laughs> Read popular culture, popular fiction. <laughs> Understood. So, culture and society by Raymond Williams is against that high notion of culture. Culture and society asserted two things. One, that culture is a whole way of life. Culture is how you live. 
lived reality. That is what is culture. That is why it is important to travel. Many people make a lot of money with their vlogs these days. They travel to other countries, they show uh, places there, food there, people there, they you know, talk about uh, cultures that we don't know. Th that is a, an exercise in cultural studies. That is an exercise in popular culture. Because what they are showing is lived reality. Did you understand? Culture is a way of life. A lived culture. Two, Raymond Williams also says culture means the arts and the learning. Not only people's lived culture, that is popular culture, there are also the arts and the learning. But arts is not only the high classical art. Art is also the local, the people's art. Did you understand? That is why today we can do research on social media posts. We can do research on selfies, as I said. We can do research on, um, you know, small practices in... Um, uh, Postmodernism, Francois Lyotard, Jean Francois Lyotard famously said that uh, postmodernism is incredulity towards meta narratives. Today we talk not only about meta narratives, we also talk about mini narratives. Yes. Our small practices, our individual lives, our own art, that also is, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, art, uh, you know, made by uh, drawings of uh, people suffering from trauma. You can do research if you want. Imagine, uh, let, let us imagine that some, somebody who is a rape victim has drawn pictures after that, showing trauma. Somebody who is uh, a victim of war has drawn pictures. You know, you can collect, if, if available, these pictures that people have drawn as a result of trauma. And do research on that. That is not great classical art like Da Vinci's or Picasso's or Michelangelo's. It is all individual people expressing themselves. That also can be do, done research on. Why? Because culture is no longer high and mighty. There is a related concept called culture is ordinary. It was also the name of an article, title of an article written by Raymond Williams. This means culture is not democratic. Sorry, not elitist, but democratic. Related concept. Isn't it clear? Yes, then, uh, he asserted, Raymond Williams asserted that democracy and culture should develop together. Culture is one thing, democracy is another. Not like that. People's culture, people's art, people's expression, people's political freedom. They are all interrelated. He shows that how we describe, how we modify, how we exchange and preserve experience, what we do with our experience is fundamental to the development of culture and society. In that sense, it is important that you take selfies. <laughs> when there is a workshop, it is important that you uh, write about it in Facebook, you post pictures about it, you comment on what other people have said about it. All that is are different ways in which you describe experience, modify experience. Experience, it is very important for me that not only really do you enjoy in this class, it is very important for me that you write about it in Facebook and social media. Isn't it important for me? How you feel today is not enough. How you describe it is also important. Clear? How you describe it is important. Experience is important. How you modify experience is important. How you exchange and preserve experience is important. That is why our social media is important. That is why we take pictures. That is why we preserve experience. Because it is a fundamental way in which cultures and societies develop. Uh, even though people make fun of uh, you know, selfie culture and... Uh, social media culture, it is very important that we engage in all these activities. He studies, Raymond Williams studies cultural production to understand how forms of communication such as the press, such as advertising, education, etc. were instrumental in the function of capitalism. Even as we know that social media or press or education, etc. give us freedom, give us individuality and independence. It is wonderful that we have education. It is wonderful that we have the social media. We have so much, uh, so many avenues for self-expression. 
we have become so independent and confident because of all that but these avenues are also ways in which capitalism reaches us it is through education and literary theory that capitalism teaches you give up your gujarati identity become american global it is through the same social media in which we find enjoyment and uh, individuality it is through the same social media that capitalism makes you buy unnecessary things and become victims of consumption so it is two pronged it is both ways double edged sword right so cultural production is studied to understand how forms of communication is instrumental are instrumental in the function of capitalism we, in a world where uh, all communication is shut down no capitalism will survive capitalism won't survive capitalism needs us to communicate our communication is the way in which capitalism survives raymond williams shows raymond williams long revolution came in 1961 the title long revolution long revolution the title refers to how coming generations the future generations the young people the student communities how they will change culture and society when i see student movements across india and the world or oh, oh, no movement is entirely wrong sorry entirely right also there will be mistakes everything they are saying may not be right some many of the things that they are saying are right but they will be crushed etc it is like that but it looks like raymond williams's long revolution is coming true it looks like the coming generations are going to change our culture and society are you getting me that uh, through the how will the coming generations change culture through the increasing role of popular and democratic values in the society which will bring freedom and change actually before the you know student outburst across india happened in the past month i was thinking that contemporary generation of students are all apolitical i thought they don't know politics i thought they will never get uh, involved in politics like this that is what i thought because mainstream politics mainstream media they don't consume no student these days sits and reads newspapers unless he is preparing for civil services <laughs> no student is traditionally uh, in the i mean the young the most contemporary generation they are not consumers of traditional media or uh, traditional modes of communication even but they are posting in social media they be using alternate media was also enough it is only that every age is political i understand now every age is political when the media changes it changes from traditional to alternate that's all in some other ways they have remained political they have their views on culture and politics and life the contemporary generation also are you following me yes, yes. it is not that they are apolitical only thing is that they are i am talking about you your uh, ways of understanding reality and politics have changed it is not like it was 50 years ago but that doesn't mean you are apolitical that doesn't mean you are you do not know anything understood so the coming generations by their use of popular and democratic values and ways of communication they will bring freedom and change three elements within sorry forget structures of feeling there are three kinds of culture this is what is important dominant culture residual culture and emergent culture dominant culture is how we live at this time what are the dominant aspects of our culture at this time residual culture is the past cultures that we don't follow now but they still remain in a little way sometimes it makes its appearance for example in gujarat as well as kerala we are more uh, modern and metropolitan than traditional all of us wear western clothes all of us eat uh, met metro food we all use uber and uh, eat at restaurants and all that but that is dominant but our residual culture is also there at least in some occasions in festivals or sometime in the day or you know at some times our 
earlier culture makes its appearance. We, at some points, we will still wear traditional clothes. We will still simulate traditional values. We will still eat in a traditional manner and live in a traditional manner. Those are residual. In America, consumerism is dominant. Feudalism has completely gone. But feudalism is still there in traces. Feudal values are still there in traces. Feudalism is residual. In every age, there are also emergent cultures. Something new coming. Counterculture movements are emergent cultures. Did you understand? Everybody will not follow it. But, uh, for example, uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, let, let me take a silly example. All of us wear nail polish. Silly example, okay? But it will help you, all, all of us women, that is. All of us women wear nail polish. That is dominant. There is, I suppose there is nobody in this room who has never worn nail polish. No woman in this room who has never worn nail polish either in toes or fingers at some point in life. Even if we are not using it now, it doesn't mean you never used it. All of us every day do not wear mehendi. But mehendi is a residual thing. It is there. Sometimes we might. Like you are wearing. Are you wearing mehendi every day in your life? No, sometimes only you wear. So dominant is our main uh, urban practices. Residual is our traditional. Uh, I don't know if anybody has used nail art. You know, very expensive uh, paintings on nails and uh, like models have, you know, long nails and you know, on which the, some things are, you know, decorated with. Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, pictures are made on the nail and uh, uh, you know stones and things are uh, put on the nails it is a more emergent that emergent might become dominant later there might be a day if I come here the three years later probably all of you will be wearing nail art <laughs> nail polish came as uh, emergent once upon a time everybody wore only mehendi but uh, nail polish rarely some people wore Hundred years ago, it must have been like that. <laughs> Did you understand? So, emergent is countercultural. It is not very common, but emergent might become dominant later. Isn't it clear? Yeah. It is like that. So, countercultural movements uh, sometimes they challenge existing dominant cultures. Sometimes they become dominant cultures. Raymond Williams has also written other books like Communications, The Country and the City, Keywords, Marxism and Literature. And uh, I, I'm not going into all that. Communications studies various forms of communication in Europe and America, especially Britain, especially Britain. He wrote mostly about Britain. Starting from newspapers to contemporary, uh, only in 1962 it was. So all the contemporary media was not there. So all the media that existed at that time, he is studying to show how media constantly construct and negotiate reality. Media is not an innocent thing. It is not just describing reality. It is constructing our reality. It is negotiating our reality. It is helping us to understand reality in the way they want. Reality is not a neutral thing. The people who use the media, the power wielding people who use the media, they will make us understand reality in the way they want using the media. Did you understand? Pakistan is a country where there are Muslims and Hindus. India is a country where there are Muslims and Hindus. In Pakistan, some people are terrorists. Not all. There is no country where all people are terrorists. Dominantly, some countries have terrorism, yes. That doesn't mean nobody in India is terrorist also. There might be terrorists in India also. I personally, because I have traveled abroad and my husband works abroad, etc. I have met a lot of wonderful Pakistani people. They are not terrorists. They are ordinary people like us. They don't hate us. In fact, they love us. The people I have met, I mean. I don't mean all Pakistanis. A lot of Pakistanis hate us, like a lot of Indians hate Pakistanis. But I have Pakistani friends who are so, I don't know what to say. They are, they are unmatched in hospitality. 
I have a friend in Qatar where my husband works. If I, if my, if we tell them, okay, we are visiting you, for sure, they would have made some 30 dishes. You, they, I won't be able to go from their house without eating breakfast, lunch and dinner. So many dishes. They will definitely give me expensive clothes and gifts. Only like this they know how to be friends. So much hospitality. I can't imagine doing that to anybody in India, forget in Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> so, wonderful people are there everywhere. But, how does the media train us? The media trains us to think that every Pakistani is our enemy. Everybody in Pakistan is a terrorist. Like that, we, media doesn't say that, but it gives us the feeling. No film ever says everybody is in Pakistan is a terrorist. Nobody says. But media will create images and ideas in such a way that we end up thinking it is our fault. We end up thinking, yeah, all Pakistanis are our enemies. This is very dangerous. Not only India and Pakistan's case. So many nations are fighting, communities are fighting, hating each other, killing each other because of media. It is very important that we talk about communications and media and how it corrupts us, how it uh, misrepresents people, how it influences us. This is a very important book in that sense. Raymond Williams' communications studies various forms of communication to show how they continually construct and negotiate reality. Until we say, okay, okay, Pakistanis are our enemies, agreed. <laughs> Until we think like that, they will bombard us with information and images and selectively. Nobody ever talks about, except in the social media sometimes, nobody ever talks about that wonderful Pakistani who loves that Indian and sacrificed his life for that Indian or things like that. There might be people like that. We only hear about how they hate us, they are trying to kill us, we should also take revenge on them, like that only we hear. So media influences us. It gives us certain perceptions which are not actually real. Partial reality becomes naturalized as the reality. A lot of women cook for their husbands and children and have wonderful families. They are the uh, guiding light in their families, etc. Majority of women are like that. What about women who do not cook for their husband? I do not cook for my husband. Not because I don't love him, not because I'm a bad wife, but because for me, my priority is different. My husband also understands. When he comes home from Qatar for one month, I don't even make him one cup of tea. Because I know and he knows that I can still be a wonderful wife and we can have a good relationship even if I don't spend time making a cup of tea. I don't cook at all. Not because I don't know. I like cooking and I know cooking also. But if I turn to cooking, I won't be able to make books or teach or travel or do anything else. The kitchen will like trap me. <laughs> As a policy, the first decision I took in my career is I will not cook. That doesn't make me any less a woman. When I pay somebody money to cook for me, I am giving somebody a job which is greater than I make money for her. So that she can cook for me and so that she can run my family, run her family as well as mine. Isn't it empowering for her? Isn't it better that I make money to, uh, for some family to live than I cook my own food? I thought like that. So, um, why did I say this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Women, I was talking about representation. It is true that many, but ad, I was talk, going to talk about advertisements. In advertisements, you always see women cooking, cleaning, looking after their families as if only those are women. <laughs> Did you understand? No woman is there in any advertisement who doesn't cook. If a woman doesn't cook and her husband cooks for her, it is possible that the woman might make more money. The husband doesn't have a good enough job, so he does also the cooking. Isn't it possible? Yes. <laughs> it is possible. Why not? What is wrong with it? 
but you laughed <laughs> will you want to marry a man like that no. suppose you are highly educated and no wait listen suppose you are educated and you have a job and you are not yet married <laughs> suppose you are not yet married a man says i don't have a good job but if you marry me i promise you i will look after the cooking and cleaning and cleaning the house and when you give birth to children i will look the, look after them you can pursue your career no problem you will feel he is so much less a man even though theoretically we can agree we don't want a husband like that see are we empowered <laughs> do we really want to be liberated i don't know you see so i was saying that reality is not an absolute truth reality is negotiated it is constructed media images constructed one another thing i stopped doing is i do not watch television <coughs> every day if you watch television even if you are watching news channels those advertisements and it is it will make you paranoid it will make you mentally diseased i think <laughs> i am able to live my life happily traveling uh, i am not a conventional mother i am not a conventional wife i am not a conventional daughter i have three men in my life i my husband my father and my son i do not behave like a conventional woman to eat all three of them but nobody questions me i am happy I, they accept me as i am there are no problems at all in my family i think because we don't watch television <laughs> <laughs> i hope you get what i mean yes, yes. <laughs> the country and the city analyzes the concepts of the countryside and the city two concepts countryside and the city to show how these concepts symbolize socio economic changes under industrialization and capitalism countryside and city are not innocent and uh, uh, absolute truths like reality is not an absolute truth industrialization and capitalism have defined country and city in certain ways for example i have a husband who works in the city of doha he earns a lot of money also and he uses very inexpensive chandrika soap <laughs> he is living in the gulf where all sorts of soaps from across the world are available and he has the money also to buy it but he uses chandrika soap <laughs> if he wants a change he will use medimix soap <laughs> <laughs> do you have medimix here Yes. Yes. you have right yes very much see you people don't even know because you are using all dove and pears and other things <laughs> people think what something is seriously wrong with this man because he doesn't conform to the definition of city living in a city you are expected to behave in certain ways you are expected to be wear certain clothes live in certain lives in a certain lifestyle isn't it yes. city and countryside are not absolute innocent things it contain within it a lot of traps where through which industrialization capitalism etc work what is wrong in living in the city and uh, you know using chandrika soap or medimix soap i don't know let him use there is nothing wrong in it but somehow it is wrong <laughs> okay understood what i'm saying so key words uh, so i'm saying that countryside and the city are concepts that i'm using some silly examples so that you will remember S ah this is the point she talked about kanchandriga so immediately you will click the right answer in the exam <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Raymond Williams analyzes the concept of countryside and the city to show how these concepts symbolize socio-economic changes under industrialization and capitalism. Key words is another book where he discusses various concepts and categories of culture. Marxism and literature is where he introduces the concept of cultural materialism. Raymond Williams talks about ideology, hegemony, base, and superstructure, all Marxist idea, Marxist concepts, and he talks about cultural materialism. 
What is cultural materialism? It is a method of criticism rooted in Marxism. Cultural materialism is a method of criticism rooted in Marxism, which stresses the interrelationship between cultural artifacts, that is language, literature, clothing, food, etc., and their socio-historical context. What is the relationship between... Uh, this is how we began our conversation. What is the relationship between your language and socio-historical context, your literature that you write or read and your socio-historical context? What is the relationship between your other cultural artifacts like clothing or food and socio-historical context? Water. I was going to drink water, then I thought I am holding one example in my hand. <laughs> what is the need of this? A waste of plastic, some 10 or 15 rupees it might have been. Why can't we just have pure water from the ordinary drinking water instead of bottled water? So much, I'm not criticizing, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> explaining as an example. When I go to restaurants, until recently, I, th I, I told them, no, I want bottled water because I did not trust their uh, water, whether it will give me diseases. Now I say, wherever I go, I say, no bottled water, only, even if I get disease, doesn't matter, it is better than throwing away some plastic, I think. Mm. If I get diseases five, ten times, I will become immune, after that I won't get diseases also. Mm. It is better to get a few diseases, I think. If, if they come, let us see what will... I won't take allopathy medicine either. I don't take... I have, for years I have not taken allopathy medicine. Because it's chemicals. It destroys your body. It lose, makes you lose your immunity. As I told you, I cannot avoid all these chemicals altogether. But in small ways, one bottle doesn't make any difference, you will think. But one bottle makes the difference of one bottle. When you spend money, 5 rupees doesn't make differ difference, you think. But when you go to the shop, if it is 5 rupees more, you will get angry, right? <laughs> MRP is 20 rupees, but give me 25 rupees. Will you give? Why? 5 rupees doesn't make a difference. Give. <laughs> Even small things make a difference. Every day, if I avoid one bottle and I inspire 100 people not to use bottles, it will be a revolution. See, did you understand? I won't drink this. <laughs> Give me some water if you have. I just need a drink of water. Can you open it for me? As I spoke also, I thought, okay, but doesn't matter, one bottle I'll drink. But then I thought, no, I won't. Let somebody else will drink, no problem, but at least one bottle less. Thank you. So, cultural materialism stresses the relationship between cultural artifacts. This is also a cultural artifact. Fifty years ago, this bottle wouldn't have been here. You would have given me in a jug. Cultural materialism stresses the interrelationship between cultural artifacts like language, literature, bottle of water and their socio-historical context. There is a politics in this. Cultural materialism is political. You have to analyze everything in culture in a political angle, from a political angle. Culture is a productive process. It is rooted in the means of production and ideology. We all think water is impure, let us drink mineral water. Thinking that mineral water is pure. Actually, they have taken it from some tap and sealed it and called it mineral water probably. You can't even get pure water. Even if you take underground water, it is impure because that is also polluted. Yes. Did you understand? So, culture is rooted in the means of production and its ideology. The culture of drinking mineral water is rooted in the production companies that made this and marketed it and taught us some values of cleanliness and um, you know uh, disease causing germs etc all the products taught us there are so many germs around us so we need detergents so we need cleaning powder so we need mineral water so we need most of the things we need today 
we have to stop using so much soap so much shampoo we have to stop using deodorants it is okay if you have a little dirt on your body or sweat on your body you don't have to be spick and span all the time because all these things we are using because of fear of dirt and germs and smell and uh, all these things are harming us that culture we have of this brushing so many times every day and after that also eating mouth fresheners and you know i remember before all this culture came my mouth felt differently now it is like my inside my mouth there is no layer one layer is missing i think because of constant use of mouth fresheners and brushing and because oh cleanliness <laughs> did you understand what i'm saying yes we don't need all these things all these cultural uh, ideas we have are actually rooted in production markets Jonathan Dolimore and Alan Sinfield have written a very major book in cultural materialism called Political Shakespeare. Jonathan Dolimore came to Kerala last time and today is the one first anniversary of his coming to Kerala and he had posted in his Facebook page we are all friends of Jonathan Dolimore. <laughs> yeah, he's such a down to earth man, wonderful man. And he said in memory of my wonderful days in Kerala or something. <laughs> and this morning i saw the facebook post and i thought what a coincidence today i'm going to talk about him in political shakespeare he says he, they show how dominant hegemonic forces there are some dominant hegemonic forces that appropriate canonical texts to make us accept certain cultural values rather than others for example shakespeare why did shakespeare become the canon and not any other writer because there were some things in shakespeare's works that the dominant people at that time in the 18th century wanted us to follow something becomes the canon something becomes uh, the major cultural practice dominant cultural practice not innocently because it contains within it some values that the dominant people want us to have for example imagine that you're all students in a, students or teachers in one college imagine that you're all students or teachers in one college in bhavnagar <laughs> that college day is coming the college day of that college is coming imagine everybody all men and women should have a dress code women we forget the men all women should have a dress code we, we, men also should have but <laughs> <laughs> i am using this as an example so just stay outside the example for some time <laughs> <laughs> don't feel left out don't go i will call you <laughs> women should have a dress code listen to me will the college say every woman should wear sari or lehenga or choli or whatever i don't know what the names are <laughs> gagra choli or whatever <laughs> traditional clothes like that or will they say every woman should wear tight jeans and come every woman should wear tight jeans one option option a option b sari or other traditional wear what will they say traditional wear why not jeans it will be it will look good if everybody wears jeans sari or that dress code becomes the dominant canonical accepted code because it contains some values that the college authorities want to assert they don't want to assert the values associated with genes <laughs> understood the college authorities do not they will support sari because sari represents some values femininity submission beauty <laughs> not sexiness but beauty <laughs> not independence and freedom but submission not gender neutral equality but submission and femininity like that shakespeare is like a sari <laughs> shakespeare became the canon because shakespeare represents some values that those people wanted us to believe in to accept such as englishness shakespeare created an england in his works 
Cre Shakespeare created an English consciousness in his works. That is why Shakespeare became the canon. If Shakespeare wrote all his works about India, because India was ruled by England at that time, would Shakespeare become the canon in English literature? No. No way. Shakespeare could have written about India also. All his works. Did you understand? Why do some people get Nobel Prize? Because they support the views of America and Europe in some way or the other. Orhan Pamuk is from Turkey. He showed the underside of Turkey, the, all the corruption happening in Turkey. And he's a good writer, so immediately Nobel Prize. <laughs> Mo Yan, Chinese writer, showed the corruption in China, immediately. Good writer also, Nobel Prize. You are also, you're also getting Nobel Prize. Are you from India? Are you a good writer? Have you shown the corruption of India? Nobel Prize. <laughs> Writers who, why does Noam Chomsky who criticizes America without any rest, why is he never getting any award? He should be given Nobel Peace Prize or some other prize. Will he ever get? There is a politics behind it. <laughs> who is getting awards? Who is the canon? It's not innocent. It is because they support mainstream perspectives in some way or the other. <coughs> Did you understand? So. Uh, Jonathan Dollymore and Alan Sinfield show how dominant hegemonic forces appropriate canonical texts. They take and use canonical texts to make us accept certain cultural values rather than others. Like sari will make us accept certain cultural values rather than others. Clear? Cultural materialism is the British counterpart of American new historicism. And it is more political. It also shows that literature is rooted in culture, in history. Literature cannot be isolated from the context. Literature and the context are looked at together and in a very political way. That is what is cultural materialism, a term coined by Raymond Williams in the book Marxism and Literature. Next is Stuart Hall, 1932. I said 2002 earlier. Who died in 2002? Somebody died in 2002. Who died? <laughs> I don't know. I was under the impression he died in 2002. I'm so sorry. He lived some more time. 12 years more. <laughs> Will you check online and see when he died? I need to know when he died. <laughs> 1932 to 2014. Correct. So somebody else it is who died in 2002. <laughs> it is there somewhere. We will see. So Stuart Hall was a Marxist sociologist and cultural theorist born in Kingston in colonial Jamaica. So recently he died. Huh? He, uh, were, he was born in colonial Jamaica. And as a man who grew up in Jamaica, he had an, his family was uh, aspiring to be like whites. They wanted more education. His mother was not fully black. She was half black only. The family was trying to transcend their blackness, the limitations of their blackness. And Stuart Hall had an ambivalent relationship with the identity of his aspiring, privileged black family. Did you understand? He was not like that. He embraced his blackness more truthfully. He arrived in Oxford, Oxford on a Rhodes scholarship in 1951 and he had ambivalent feelings for Britain also. He liked Britain and enjoyed being there etc. but at the same time questioned Britain's racism and uh, he embraced his blackness. I told you already he was the founder of the New Left Review. He became director of CCCS. Yo, oh, so many years I've given. <laughs> You check it out. I'm so bad with some years. 1971, I said earlier. Now I'm saying 74. I have to edit it. I'm so sorry. I, this is because of, uh, part of the time I was typing in all these things from my notes, etc. in 3 o'clock in the morning. When 71 and 74 made no difference. <laughs> I have to sit down and study the years. I'm so bad at it. Um, big mistake. So he became director of CCCS, okay, and esta helped established cultural studies. He focused on popular, low, 
status, cultural forms, and traced in them the interweaving of culture, power, and politics. I don't have to explain. He looked at the cultural forms and how culture, power, and politics are interwoven in them. Did you know that there is no single work by Stuart Hall? Stuart Hall always wrote in collaboration with others or edited other people's works. It is so amazing. As if he does not exist as an individual, but in relationship with other scholars and other blacks. Did you understand? He embraced a collaborative identity. It is amazing. And Stuart Hall, in 79, became the professor of sociology at Open University. Open University is where people who, cannot who could not study in conventional regular system went public, you know, like distance education. The people who either failed in uh, traditional education or for some reason who could not go there. So they were all the marginal people in the open university. He loved working for them, working with them. He was delighted to reach out to those who couldn't survive in the conventional educational system. Are you able to follow? And Stuart Hall at this time uh, wrote, wrote against what he called Thatcherism. Margaret Thatcher, the conservative a uh, politician had become the Prime Minister of England at that time and he wrote against the authoritarian populism of Margaret Thatcher. Authoritarian populism means what? Populism means uh, going by popular demand rather than truth and justice. Rather than do what is right, rather than do what is just and truthful. Going, our politics today is populist. We know that it is wrong to do certain things. The government should not do certain things. But emotionally, we want it. <laughs> we, and government also does it. Even though it is wrong, all governments are like that. Trump's government is like that. Postmodern politics is populist. That is going by public demand, going by the emotions of the public, rather than what is just and truthful and uh, right. Did you understand? Margaret Thatcher was like that. He wrote against it. In the 1990s, he wrote against Britain's racism. After his university career ended, he collaborated with a lot of young artists and filmmakers, explored the politics of black subjectivity, and had a new lease of intellectual life. He was a very brilliant thinker. As I told you, he led to a crop of black thinkers emerging like Paul Gilroy, Angela McRobbie. Remember I told you? Uh, those people who came after Stuart Hall uh, established a black aesthetics and a black critical tradition in England. One important theory of Stuart Hall is the model of communication that he uh, pro uh, proposed in 1973. For the first time, he laid the foundation of a cultural understanding of communication. All these things will look easy for you because I have already explained all these things. Communication is not just speaking and exchanging information. Communication is rooted in culture. Communication is political. I have explained that already. Communication is rooted in culture. How you communicate, what you communicate. For example, let me give you one silly example. Crying. In my culture, for women, to cry is no problem. All women cry all the time, I think. I also cry very easily. When I teach one three-month or six-month batch in Trivandrum, at least two, three times I will cry in the class in front of everyone. <laughs> it is normal. No problem. But in some other cultures, people are scandalized. What? Crying in public or... Nobody cries, I think, in some cultures. In your culture, do you cry? In public also? No. You don't? Sometimes. Around the people we know. Ah, with people you know. I mean, yeah, of course, people you know. <laughs> <laughs> For example, will you give a speech here and then break into tears? I can do that. You will control? Mm, I don't control. <laughs> Okay, it's a challenge, okay? Uh, at the end of the day, I will give a speech. You also give a speech. Let us see who will cry. <laughs> 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 so.
so expressing emotion is a form of communication to give one silly example but it is cultural sometimes you have to do it sometimes you shouldn't do it especially when people get married or when somebody dies in some culture in for example in in some christian communities when a relative or if somebody in the family dies you should not cry because you have to pray and you have to praise god because that soul has been saved and taken in in uh, i remember when i was a child i went to one one of my very strict christian shares her father died and i went to her house i noticed that her mother herself nobody is crying there everybody is praying and singing in my culture if somebody dies nobody sings <laughs> they were all singing prayers it was a big surprise for a child i was a child and then i stood there and because she is my close friend i started crying a little bit because i because i wondered how it will be when a father dies i felt so sad and i started crying and then one of their relatives came and told me you should not cry it is an insult they explained to me it is an insult to the departed soul the soul has joined god and we should not cry we should praise god we should be happy that the, uh... <laughs> so different from my culture my culture it doesn't it is not like that did you understand what i am saying yes. so i i i just gave a cult thing uh, an example that we can all uh, relate to but look at magazines look at television news television news in india is very different from television news in bbc or cnn yes. because there are cultural differences how people look at news is different did you understand so model of communication laid the foundations of a cultural understanding of communication communication is not a neutral thing communication requires to know which culture where did you understand he talks about four stages in communication production circulation use and reproduction i will give you the example of a fairness cream like fair and lovely to explain production means production of the message suppose you are working in the uh, advertising in an advertising company fair and lovely approaches your company to make an ad big task isn't it it is not easy you might even lose your job if you don't do it pro properly how you produce that image is very important isn't it it is not easy what images what is the content how you should present it so much is there and even a slight change might make a big difference in an ad even a slight change might make a big difference instead of one uh, actor if you use another actor it might completely change the whole uh, uh, ad itself did you understand so production is important then circulation how this ad is going in to which tv channel it will go or will it go to youtube you need to know all that that circulation is also important ads that you see in the newspaper do not have the same effect as the ads that you see in uh, social media in social media you may not believe it but when you see in some magazines or newspapers it will become so authentic and you will trust it yeah it must be true because how it is circulated matters how images are circulated matters that is circulation thirdly use or consumption of the message as meaningful these days when we uh, upload youtube audios all of us might do it youtube audios you upload you go to analytics and see how much time it is a 10 minute video not audio sorry video it's a 10 minute video if there are 1000 uh, uh, view views but everybody is viewing only less than 1 minute yeah. how far it is consumed how it is consumed is important did you understand how it is consumed and why immediately you have to think why are people not watching more how can i retain their attention clear so ad nobody oh, fair and lovely ad is coming everywhere that you created everywhere but nobody sees it completely the moment it begins people are changing it <laughs> skipping it nobody wants to see oh fourthly the reproduction or the effect of the image how many people buy fair and lovely after seeing your ad does the ad have any effect the effect of the message leading to action i don't i i am not a producer of any product like that but when i when me or sir or you 
when we organize a program, when we put up an image uh, advertising a uh, workshop or an event that we are organizing, we are all concerned with all this. Suppose you have a, you are conducting competitions in your department. You want people from other departments to come. The image is produced well, it is circulated well, people are all seeing, but nobody came. <laughs> See? So, we are all concerned with this. It is not about some company alone. Then, Stuart Hall also talks about encoding and decoding. It is part of his writings on communication theory and reception theory. Encoding is the production of the message using verbal and non-verbal symbols. And decoding is the negotiation of the receiver with the text based on his or her knowledge, cultural background and experiences. Again, if you take Fair and Lovely at, uh, encoding is how the meanings are put into the message. Sometimes some meanings are directly put. Some, for example, uh, I am reminded of a Malayalam ad for curry powder. There is a famous Malayalam ad for curry powder which I don't like at all. <laughs> there is a bowl of curry on the table and the woman is waiting some, for some, something she is waiting. Suddenly her husband comes from office. So she was waiting for her husband. And he comes, looks at the curry, dips his finger into the curry like this. Are you paying attention? The husband is dipping his finger in the curry. Listen. <laughs> ah, he dips his finger in the curry like this, licks his finger and says, Mmm, fish curry is good. How did you manage it? <laughs> he says in Malayalam, Fish curry is good. How did you, obviously very young people, newly married must be. How did you manage it? And the girl doesn't say anything. Eastern curry powder. <laughs> this is the ad. I showed you the ad now. This was the ad. How meanings are put into the message. Sometimes meanings are directly put. Some, if you want to make good fish curry, use Eastern curry powder. If you use Eastern curry powder, everybody will like, even your husband will like your curry. <laughs> that is the denotation. The, but there are other layers of encoding. Other meanings are also there. Like, wives should try to please their husbands by making good curry. That wives are the people who, who cook curry. That uh, many young women these days do not know how to cook. They will have to use Eastern curry powder etc. Very care, carefully the people should make these ads. Uh, uh, carelessly, if some of the uh, you know, connoted meanings or deep meanings become surface meanings, we won't like it. Some meanings should remain very subtle. Some meanings should remain very superficial and powerful and direct. Isn't it? In an advertisement, if the meanings that are supposed to be subtle, that subtle meaning should be there. We can't show a man as cooking curry. If we, we show, okay, husband is making curry. Some, but these days we have that also. Rarely on one Sunday, husband cooks curry with Eastern curry powder. That also can be added. But imagine this advertisement. Husband has made curry. He is waiting anxiously for wife. <laughs> wife comes. Oh, this is not like the curry you make every day. Today it is good. Every day it is so bad. How did you manage? Wife is asking husband. And husband said, I bought Eastern curry powder. You might laugh at it. Even, but you don't feel like buying. Something is disturbing. It is not what we expect. Even we feminists. Even we feminists don't want that curry powder. <laughs> Did you understand what I mean? Yes. So it is very carefully that you should encode text with meaning. It is like writing a love letter or uh, email or whatever. <laughs> very carefully you should write. Unnecessarily if you, some meanings come to the fore, the whole plan will fl flop. <laughs> Did you understand? So encoding and decoding. When I see this advertisement, I told you in the beginning, I don't like it. I don't like that ad. Based on my experience, based on my cultural background, 
based on my knowledge of culture studies, deconstruction, etc. When I decode that ad, I don't like it. It can be preferred reading of the text. It can be negotiated reading of the text or oppositional reading of the text. That means preferred reading is Eastern curry powder wants you to think, wow, let me buy Eastern curry powder because I want my husband also to say this. All women go and buy Eastern curry powder. <laughs> that is preferred reading. Negotiated reading means I don't believe women should always cook and but in, when I cook, I will buy Eastern only. <laughs> I don't accept it exactly as they give me, negotiated, but still I accept most of what they say. That is negotiated reading. Mine is oppositional reading. How dare they show this? I will never buy Eastern curry powder. <laughs> that is also one kind of reading. That is oppositional reading. Did you understand? Who said all this? Stuart Hall said this. This is about encoding and decoding. Now, why is all this important? It is not just fun. It is not for fun we are saying all these things. Constantly we are encoding and decoding messages in culture. When we post something in social media, we are encoding. People are decoding it. Yes. Lot of things happen in culture because of the ways in which we decode it. The government did something. People did not protest. They thought encoding is correct. There is preferred reading. The government did second thing. People did not protest. They thought, okay, we are right. Encoding is going well. The government did third thing. Everybody protested. <laughs> Probably, they were decoding in a different way all the time. Many times, rebellions and subculture movements, protest movements, etc. emerge because of decoding. Did you understand what I am saying? Decoding is very important in culture. Encoding also. This is how we communicate with people. This is how cultural formations happen. Dick Hebdige, who has written the book Subculture, has said that subcultures arise when dominant cultures are decoded in new ways. Dominant culture says something, but people take it in a different way. And then subculture movements might come into being. Did you understand? So, uh, for example, in the Victorian period, all women wore skirts like this. with hook. There were wire hoops yes. that they wore on their waist. On top of it, 6 to 12 skirts. Yes. Have you seen our Kadagali, Kerala? Uh, like that they wore skirts, like this they had to walk. And uh, these women who wore these skirts could not go out of their houses. Because the skirt is getting stuck here. <laughs> the skirt is getting stuck on the door. Have you seen in movies, you have to lift the skirt in a certain way in order to go out. That skirt was a means of preventing them mobility, denying them mobility, preventing them from running away with their boyfriends or going to schools and colleges and sitting down. Can you imagine sitting in a <laughs> bench and studying? <laughs> Some women in the Victorian period tried to wear com more comfortable blouses and trousers and more comfortable clothes they began to wear in the Victorian period. This was called rational dress movement. These women, that was an, an emergent culture. These women were treated like bad women, like prostitutes. They were attacked. They were crushed. That movement was crushed. But it gave rise to a new fashion. In the Edwardian period, even though those women were treated very badly, it gave rise to the columnar silhouette. Before that, it was the inverted umbrella silhouette. The shape of the human bo female body should be like the inverted umbrella. Do you understand? Yes. After that, it became the columnar silhouette. That new culture emerged because of decoding. Because women realized, no, we don't want to take more of this. We are going to wear comfortable clothes. They gave up their uh, older clothing and turned to new ways of clothing because 
of some decoding and encoding that happened there. They interpreted it in new ways. Even though those same women who wore columnar silhouette dresses must have attacked the rational dress movement activists. In the Victorian period when some women started to wear comfortable clothes and ride bicycles and go out on their own etc. They were treated very badly. Women themselves would have attacked these people, these activists. But those women began to wear more comfortable clothes because of the rational dress movement. I hope you understand. So all these things are happening in culture because of uh, communication and all these things that Stuart Hall and others have talked about. Stuart Hall talked about cultural representation. It is from the book Representation. Cultural representations and signifying practices. He says culture has a central role in representation. There are multiple shifting meanings to images. Every image has not one meaning. Every image has multiple meanings. Every image has shifting meanings. You post uh, a picture in say, Facebook, your uh, photo in Facebook, you intend one meaning, people get that meaning, but the more they look at it, like my shaved head for example. <laughs> Take the example of my photo with the shaved head. How do I look? New hairstyle or something I said. I only meant, but people interpreted it in so many ways. Some people thought I am a rebel, you should not be such a rebel and activist. Come on, I am not an activist, I am just shaved my head because my hair is falling, I had to tell people. They interpreted too many meanings into it. Every image has multiple meanings, shifting meanings. What is important is the absent part of the image. It is equally or more important than the present part. What the image doesn't say, the absent part, reading between the lines you say, that is more important than, Roland Barthes has talked about images at length like this. Roland Barthes interpretation of images has been very influential on cultural studies. And power structures, however, whatever we say, Power structures do not want multiple meanings. Power structures attempt to fix meanings as in stereotypes. Power structures attempt to fix meanings. One particular dress referring to one culture or religion or community means bad. One uh, dress referring to one community means rebel. I remember in my college days, some of my uh, friends had girls had started wearing jeans most people most women didn't wear jeans at that time i had to fight with my parents saying i want a pair of jeans they didn't buy because jeans means rebel what will people think of you they won't say that now if a girl wants to wear jeans nobody will say that now what will people think of you will they say did you understand so Jeans is rebel, was at that time in my college days a stereotype. It was a stereotype. So in every culture, at every point, there are stereotypes. If you wear traditional sari, I am wearing traditional sari. That doesn't mean I am traditional. I can be very rebellious and also wear sari. <laughs> Did you understand? So. Power structures do not want multiple meanings. They want to fix meanings on stereotypes. Stereotype of um, Sardarji means, what is Sardarji? Haven't you, aren't you familiar with Sardarji jokes and all that? Yeah. In that stereotype, what is Sardarji? Stupid fellow. Ah, stupid, stupid fellow. fellow. Like all Pakistanis are not terrorists, all Sardarjis are not stupid. stupid. <laughs> <laughs> There are certainly very intelligent Sardarjis also. Definitely. Majority of them will be intelligent, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, stereotypes, the Westerners, like Orientalism. Like Edward says, Orientalism. Uh, we fix some communities to be like that. Like at the beginning when I came, I said, I am from Kerala, I am going to teach you cultural studies. Do not attack me for being a Marxist. <laughs> like 
people in gujarat might think all might think i know you don't like people in gujarat might think all malayalis are communists all malayalis might think all gujaratis are hindu fanatics most of you may not be did you understand so we should have cultural exchange we should know people that is why i said we should travel there are all kinds of people everywhere you can't judge anybody but power structures want to fix us on one stereotype like orientalism where all westerners wanted to think that wanted us to also to think that all easterners are lazy they are poor they are criminals they are violent they are rapists they are murderers while all easterners are not like that it has nothing to do with our reality we think all americans after we watch hollywood movies we think all americans are powerful they uh, shoot with guns and they drive uh, suvs and uh, you know fight with people and they are all powerful rich there are so many americans that i know who don't even have an email <laughs> they don't know they I, i know people who do not have an email or do not check their email they are not so technologically advanced all of them there are americans who are struggling for food obviously they are stereotypes and we need to expose stereotypes stuart hall talks about cultural representation encoding decoding modes of communication etc because we should fight these stereotypes because these stereotypes misrepresent reality yo so small paul dugay <laughs> <laughs> you are laughing at my cultural artifacts <laughs> ayyo is our cultural artifact okay it has historical economic political all these contexts ah uh, i don't know how to forget it mm. paul dugay stuart hall and others introduced the concept of circuit of culture in a study of the sony walkman cassette player there was a book that they were writing about the sony walkman cassette player stuart hall was only one of the theorists a group of people were working on it and they talked about the concept of circuit of culture a concept that connects communication and capitalism they say that culture is connected in a circuit of five elements production consumption identity regulation and signification like a circuit they are all interconnected these five elements take for example a movie that creates a nationalistic image of india take a movie like uri 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 which creates a certain image of india you understand now let us see what it is one is we have already talked about production before production is making the cultural products it can be the tv the, the movie or it can also be our clothes our festivals our tv shows reproducing them also producing and reproducing them for example we have a festival in gujarat you pro, how do you produce that festival what are the things you buy how do you celebrate it and how do you represent it in pictures in the social media all that is part of production and how and why production happens in kerala we have onam it is just another day nothing very special but there are so many things of onam onam we have to do this we have to buy clothes we have to give everybody this we have to make feast this that why do we do that there is a cultural need to identify all of us we are malayalis we are not gujaratis we are not tamilians we are not we are malayalis <laughs> you understand like that gujarat will also feel at some points we are not rajasthanis we are not uh, haryanvi people we are gujaratis <laughs> you know this is how we produce culture culture is produced and reproduced in certain ways because of some political reasons because of some needs and there is also consumption how these products are used and interpreted imagine the movie again 
how is the movie made and why is it made at that time listen how is the movie made who is the actor why is it made in what way is it made it is not simple all these things are important secondly how is it consumed at what time is it released what are the reviews how is it interpreted how is it marketed and who pays for it they are all political they are all important these elements identity how the individuals groups or even non human entities got to be in the circuit what are the who are the actors there only some actors will be there other actors will not be there for example some actors who are questioning the nationalistic rhetoric of india like in south we have prakash raj he keeps questioning prakash raj will never get a role in uri film <laughs> some actors only will be there why they are there how they came to be there these are all political things that are part of identity that gives the film also an identity did you understand fourthly regulation what are the formal and informal rules that affect the film and are affected by the film there will be there are some unwritten rules in the film some things will not be shown some things will not be shown some things will be shown why and who makes these rules is it conforming to any party any people any ideology who controls these rules how they are enforced take any cultural product these elements are there and finally signification what these cultural products mean to whom and in what context when uh, the supreme court passed an order that our national anthem should be um, played at all the movie theaters that national anthem suddenly became a cultural product like a commodity it was before that just a national anthem but now it is something more than that it it has additional uh, uh, you know meanings attached to it did you understand and it involves all these things who made that rule why did they make that rule at this time you understand how do people react to it and so on and so forth every cultural product is like that every cultural product is within a circuit of culture very complicated interrelated complexity of meanings are attached to every cultural product it is necessary that we understand it major influences on so we have now con completed the major founding fathers of culture studies we have uh, passed the first phase of cultural studies the founding fathers we have already talked about richard hogarth e p thompson stuart hall raymond williams and what are the major influences on these people once more we already know frankfurt school was there new left was there there was also louis althusser he talked about ideological state apparatuses and repressive state apparatuses education is an ideological state apparatus religion is an ideological state apparatus that means what the state wants and believes in is reinforced and brought to us by education religion etc movies media religion will not say religion will say be like this do this for example christianity will say homosexuality is bad heterosexuality is correct homosexuality is sin if you are against christianity if you continue to be homosexual christianity does not have the right to attack you or kill you or put you in prison or anything but it will corrupt our mind to it will disturb us here education also it will teach us certain things against certain other things education religion etc will try to manipulate us will try to change us if you are normal within double quotes ordinary people who are easily conditioned by whatever you know and hear you don't rebel then no problem if you are different 
for example if you dare to be homosexual for one example i'm saying then the problem will start the ideological state apparatuses will turn you into an outcast you you cannot belong they will continually disturb you for example women who normally get married and look after their parent uh, father and uh, sorry parents as well as husband and children do all the cooking and cleaning at home do some job if they can which will always be less than the husband's job women like that have no problem they are ideal women women who get married or do not get married they get ma some women will get married and say i don't want children because i want a career is she a woman one some women will uh, get married and have children and say i can't bring up my children they have to be taken care of by somebody else i have to go work is she a mother did you understand those women will get into trouble you know I, i now i rebelled and i have won my case nobody questions me now but i remember my son was one and a half years old my son was nine months old when my husband got a scholarship to go to canada listen to this my husband my husband went to canada when our son was nine months old everybody was happy he got the scholarship everybody was happy they gave him one send off and sent him away family wow man he went no problem wife and child will remain at home parents will look after when my son was one and a half years old i got the same scholarship many people told me you can't go your son is only one and a half years old i said so what my parents are there my husband is there i i have the opportunity to go and do phd there i want to go many people said you can't go and they threatened me your child will forget you not in this way very subtle ways <laughs> very loving ways advice and you know it is actually mean to hurt and prevent me from going i thought why <laughs> you understand why did nobody say tell my husband you can't go you have a wife and child nobody told him everybody said go 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 to me they are saying you can't go i went my parents looked after my son nothing happened only for five, less than one year i was there i went and when i came back i i was so shocked my friends relatives neighbors when they met me again after months when i returned they were asking me questions like does your son remember you <laughs> <laughs> for many years they were saying oh yours your mother brought up your son so she, she, he might love her more than you she brought up my son for a few months come on and she is his the grandmother let him love her i don't mind they are saying this as if you and woman <laughs> how could you do this to your son <laughs> such a primitive thinking again this was 15 years ago 20, 18 years ago did you understand i am shocked that this none of their concern yeah for, a, for he didn't forget me but he was a little i was also a little i mean too sensitive will he like it because i don't know how how does he want it will he like it i was because i didn't know him and he didn't know me for a few days probably it was like that after that nothing happened he forgot about when he when i went also for the first two days or something he remembered after that he played and when i made call to him etc he didn't cry or anything he okay mother is somewhere else <laughs> society is not like that society never forgets <laughs> so <laughs> society is so bothered what will happen because she left him and went <laughs> ideological state apparatuses teach you to be normal to be ordinary to conform they won't leave you they will hurt you here whereas in the brain whereas repressive state apparatuses are like the police the army the judiciary 
they don't hurt you here they hurt your body only they will imprison you or punish you physically you know so althusser talks about it and he says ideology addresses you makes a subject of you hey stop talking when the teacher says all students are interpolated <laughs> they feel like I, the teacher is addressing me oh i, I won't talk i didn't talk <laughs> like that you ex you you feel a man and a woman are walking on the streets M men and women are walking on the street somebody makes a cat call whistle will the men think oh somebody is calling me <laughs> will the men think or will the women think why do the men not think you understand the women are interpolated yes patriarchy i am prone to be attractive to some man so they might call <laughs> whistle on me <laughs> don't laugh these days men also <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> interpolation is altusa's term for how ideology addresses you you feel like they are talking about me some movies say this is a movie that all uh, housewives should watch all women should think will think oh i am housewife i should watch <laughs> interpolation that means ideology is making a subject of you did you understand antonio gramsci talked about hegemony hegemony means domination of one over the other but the subjugated party wants to be dominated that is also there hegemony creates consent like imagine a husband beating a wife his wife there are husbands who beat their wives especially if the wife is uneducated etc she will cry and she will complain but if you try protecting her and liberating her from her husband immediately she will say he is my husband he will beat me what do you care uh. <laughs> she it's like she wants to be beaten that makes her a, a more a full, gives her more fulfillment as a wife or something because patriarchy's hegemonic power is working on her capitalism has a hegemonic power over us even though we know we should not we don't want all this we still want it did you understand and uh, roland bar talks about everything being a text every uh, cultural artifact or process is actually a text why are you wearing these clothes and not some other clothes why are you eating this food and not some other food it is a text yesterday i landed in Ahmedabad and one um, uh, driver, Delhi Bharat sir, sent to get me. He asked me. He took me to Gallops, yes. and he said, "What do you want to eat?" I said, "Gujarati food." <laughs> and we, I had a Gujarati thali. Why did I say Gujarati food? Why did not? Uh, why I didn't say KFC or something else? Or why, it is not available here. Whatever is available here, some as other Western food. Why didn't I say? why i chose gujarati food is a text did you understand it has some cultural political meanings did you understand remember it is the same me who went to canada i said i want asian food <laughs> thinking it is malayali food many times when i go to some other places my friends will say i will take you to some south indian restaurant i said no way no <laughs> south indian restaurant i will go when i go, i will eat from when i go to south india here i want to eat your food only because of this i don't get there i say so that is a text because in that text there is a play of meanings did you understand and michel fuko oh yo now I, how many of you want me to teach fuko not now i mean generally asking I'm stopping now for lunch.